told, I told you last week that um, I don't think it's just like a, a Jewish believer, but obviously, you know, I grew up going to Hebrew school and growing in a synagogue, and, you know, we were never taught anything derogatory about Yeshua. Never. I had plenty of, of Catholic friends, and most of my friends were Gentile in, in the projects, and um, nothing was ever said in any Jewish circles. He just wasn't brought up. It was like he just, he, you know, basically there was nothing negative, just nothing was said. He just didn't have anything to do with us at all. He did not not like us or anything, just a, a, a really a kind of a non-issue, and I don't mean to be disrespectful. But once I met him, I was able to see him in every page of the Torah. And obviously that has to do with my upbringing, right? Because I'm sure the average Christian doesn't see you know, Jesus in the tabernacle unless somebody tells them about it or they buy a book, right? But it's just a really neat thing to see him all over the Bible. I don't know. It, it, I don't think it makes you more saved per se, but I just think it's a really neat thing. And I think sometimes what happens with some of these neat things is it just makes God bigger, yeah. makes him a little bit more amazing. And that's always good for us, yeah. you know, because we need to make God more and more amazing every day yeah. so that our worship stays hot. Yeah. So there's seven furnishings in the tabernacle. And last week we went over four, right? We went over the Ark of the Covenant, the Mercy Seat, the Menorah, and the Table of Showbread. And that's on our website. It's on Getzel. It's on YouTube, whatever. So you can go over and look at that if you didn't see that. So we have um, three more to go over. And if you're really good, we have a bonus. It's like, seriously? The music was so good. That's what you got for us? A bonus? So let's start with the, um, the brazen altar. If you're taking notes, you're home taking notes, the brazen altar is discussed in Exodus 27, 1 through 8. I have two verses for you. It says in Exodus 27, 1 through 2, you are to make the altar of acacia wood seven and a half feet long and seven and a half feet wide. The altar is to be square and four and a half feet high. Make horns for it on, the, on its four corners. The horns are to be of one piece with it, and you are to overlay it with bronze. Um, I'm not hiding. I'm looking for something. <laughs> Do we have a picture of that? Okay, so this part, there was a grate, obviously, so the ash from the animal and the blood could seep down in there. The horns are pretty significant. You know, the horns are a place of refuge. Remember when Absalom ran into the temple and grabbed the horns? But if you've broken God's laws, the horns won't save you. Okay? You can grab onto the horns before you're tried. So those are, those are kind of significant. Obviously, they represent sacrifice. So basically, if you're looking at the picture, the altar of burnt offering was made of acacia wood, like it says, which is incorruptible wood. It's covered in bronze. It was the biggest furnishing, and no worshiper could avoid seeing it. When you walked into the tabernacle itself, and don't get confused, the tabernacle isn't the same as the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting is the holy place in the holy of holies. The tabernacle is the whole, so the outer courtyard and the tent of meeting. When you walked into the tabernacle, that thing stared you right in the face. And obviously, we're sending a message. No blood, no forgiveness. I know it's crazy, I know, because if we think the least bit in a humanistic fashion, we think, you know, I'm not that bad. You ask anybody, I'm not that bad. I could tell you that probably everybody in here at least lied once this week. In other words, when you just say to somebody, you're like, your, your phone answering machine answers, says, I'm not home right now, you are home right now. So you just lied. It doesn't have to be a huge lie, an exaggeration is a lie. Not telling the whole truth is a lie. It doesn't have to be something incredibly manipulative. 
So that means we're all liars, and the Bible says liars don't inherit the kingdom. So when we look at, when we compare ourselves to Jack the Ripper versus comparing ourselves to Yeshua the Messiah, it's a huge difference. And I, I don't know exactly why God set up things the way he did. He's God. But one of the things I could tell you is he really hates sin, and sin is destructive. It ruins people's life. Some people have been perpetrated by sin, and they will never be whole in this life. You say, Rabbi, that's crazy. We can lay hands on them. You can't forget. You can move on and get better and get restoration and be healthier. But this is not your best life. Your best life is coming. The brazen altar is also known in the scriptures as the altar of God, which is quite significant. And it's where the priest would offer substitutionary sacrifices, animal sacrifices. Does anybody know what that word is in Hebrew? If you were Jewish, you would know it's a zobach. In fact, when you look up offering sacrifice, the root word is zobach. Somebody's got to pay. But it was an innocent victim. An innocent victim is paying. It's kind of crazy, right? The animals didn't do anything wrong. They're in it. Are they not innocent victims? It's like, you know, can you imagine? Your home, anybody have a dog here? Okay, does anybody really like love their dog obsessively here? Don't, don't feel, don't, don't feel, you, you didn't even have to raise your hand, he went. Don't, don't feel bad about that. I know they become part of the family. You know, I'm not a dog hater. I know you think I am. I'm not a dog hater. I just think they're dogs. <laughs> oh, he's got the red dot at the forehead. Um, no, I don't think there's anything wrong with loving your dog and it's part of the family and, you know, when they die you feel awful. But can you imagine if, like, the priest came to your house and said, you know, you lied today, I've got to take the dog and you've got to watch. And they lay their hands on the dog, and they slit his throat in front of you, and then they pour its blood on the altar, and then they burn it. You'd feel terrible about that, right? And just let it be known, I don't hate dogs, and I'll prove it to you, because in Nicaragua, I ate dog intestines, so there. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know till after I ate it. Relax. He's unclean. Get him out of the temple. A dog intestines kosher? Check Leviticus 11, quick. So it's, it's substitutionary. Do you understand? Somebody is paying for your sin. They shouldn't have to do that. This is a progressive revelation. It, it started with the animal skins in Genesis 3. Now, how close do you think Adam was to those animals? They were like his kids. You think you're close to your dog? He was closer. And all of a sudden, they know they're guilty, right? That's repentance. They, 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 you, guilt and conviction of that guilt brings you to the door. And then all of a sudden God says, here, put these on. That's like, I mean, seriously, it'd be like God coming with the skins of your kids. I know, but I, I, you need to understand it. Don't, don't belittle the execution stake. Don't do that. And don't get caught up with things. Get caught up with Messiah. Get caught up with the cross. Be like him. Watch how filled you get with the Holy Spirit. We need more of that. We need more power. We need more words of knowledge. We need more healing. We need more deliverance. We need power. Now, the bronze is significant. Let's take a look at that word. nek o -shef. It's copper ore or bronze as a copper alloy. Now, do you have that picture again? This, this was lifted up and there were stairs. So bronze is like, they use that like a mirror. Copper is a mirror. So when you brought the animal and you laid it up there, whose face was in the mirror? Yeah, what? Well, the animal shouldn't be on there. You should. 
oh, Rabbi, that's so intense. I'm, I'm just a liar. You ever take anything that wasn't yours? You're a thief. You ever covet anything? You ever disrespected your parents? Well, I don't commit adultery. In your head, according to Yeshua, that's adultery. Yeah. I'm not beating you up, but don't lift yourself up so much either. That's all I'm saying. I'm not beating you up. I'm just come to realization that without Yeshua, we're dead in the water, man. <laughs> Done. Okay, I, listen. You know I try to do a lot of good things. By the way, our shoe ministry is doing well. Um, Bill Foster was able to contact some executives at um, Walmart. I know you're watching Bill. Bill's so old that he was able to say to them, I had a meeting with Sam Walton. <laughs> and they were like, no. And he said, yeah. He told them all about it. So we're getting some shoes from them, believe it or not. Um, and, and if that goes well, if that goes well, um, you know, it beats trying to get a manufacturer in China to get them shipped. And, um, you know, I'd like to do it in all 50 states. But I also want you to know that it's evangelistic for me. Like, we put together our own track. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily a track giver out of it, but I want the kids to see something in there. But if, if when I give them to Bibb County Schools, they're not going to let it happen. So what do you do, guys? Well, if I can't witness, the heck with the kids. They're going to be shoeless. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say take care of the poor, the one, the orphan, as long as they come to faith. But obviously, that's the hook. Look, I just want to know, my whole reason for living is to see people saved. Yeah. Just so you know, cat's out of the bag. It's not to teach you Jewish stuff. You know, that's, uh, there's other things I do, but the main thing, make no mistake, is to see that none will perish. Bottom line. Bottom line. Um, where were we before you rudely interrupted me? We were on bronze. Okay. Bronze is any of various metal alloys that just get technical, consisting of copper and zinc. That's what bronze is. Now, what do we know about zinc? Zinc is used to make galvanized iron. What do we know about iron? It's incredibly strong. Incredibly strong, right? Copper is quite malleable. So I think what God is saying, maybe something he's saying with bronze, it could have been anything, could have been... But with the bronze, because it's, it's zinc and copper, iron and malleable, I think he's saying, look, my judgment is strong. When I come back and every knee bends, even those that don't want to bend lovingly and willingly, it's too late. They can't just bend and go, okay, you're Messiah. It's too late. So his judgment is strong. But while your eyes are still open, it's malleable. Like right now, everybody in here, Every single one of our sins are written in pencil. But if, God forbid, you have a coronary right now and it's a widow maker, it becomes permanent marker. Rabbi, that sounds scary. You ready? Hell is scary. I know you don't hear about it much anymore. So you don't get scared about things that you don't hear about. But it's scary. And it's not just about going to heaven. It's about avoiding the wrath to come. Yeah. Exodus 29, 37 says something magnificent. At least I think so. It's talking about the brazen altar. And it says, seven days you will make atonement on the altar and consecrate it. Make it holy. Thus the altar will be especially holy. And whatever touches the altar will become holy. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? It says, whatever touches the altar will become holy. It needs a tie-in. That's not good enough. What are you doing? That's good. That's good. So I got to touch the brazen altar. Where's the brazen altar? How are you going to touch the brazen altar? Tabernacle's history. The temple's gone. Titus did that for us in 70 AD. Let's connect the dots. John 1.12. But to as many as did receive him, I always tell people, Jews don't need to become Gentiles. They need to receive Yeshua. They're receiving something. They're not, well, if I throw away my Judaism, what's wrong with your Judaism? Biblical Judaism is the Ten Commandments. I want you to know something. Even though the Ten Commandments were given to the Jewish people, they're for all believers. They're still very enforced today. Every single one of them, even the fourth one. 
Easy, relax. Gentiles going, yeah, you better believe the fourth one. They don't do Shabbat. They're going to hell. Not true. Not true. Relax. Not true at all. You're wrong. You're wrong. Everybody's like, yeah, 10 commands still four, especially the fourth one. They're like, yeah, they got all raised up in the seat. Yeah. He's going to talk about Shabbat now. But to as many as receive him, him as Yeshua, to those who put their trust in his person as Messiah and his power in his resurrection, he gave, Yeshua gave the right to become children of God. Don't forget how you were saved. Don't forget it, man. You're forgetting it. Don't forget it. Let's look at this word receive so we understand what does it mean to receive him? The word is lambano in the Greek, and it means to take with the hands. Think about that for a minute. First of all, this verse tells us how we become children of God. Okay? It's not open for opinion. Okay? This is how you become a child of God. It's not by good works. I've done a gazillion good works. I promise you, when I sit with God and he asks me why he should let me in, I'm not bringing up nothing. Because that other book he has that talks about Revelation, the book of life, and the books with my name on it, I want that staying locked up. I'm going to say one thing and one thing only, Yeshua. That's what I'm going to say. Absolutely. And if you say anything else, ooh, you're in trouble. Don't be an idiot. Well, I did. And I, you know, I... It's not by good works. It's not by church membership. That's why we don't, people come up to me sometimes. Can I join? Join what? Uh, the synagogue. You can't. Why? There's no membership. Why don't you have membership? Why should I have membership? It's not biblical. Well, I got to be a member. Are you born again? You're a member of the kingdom. You're a citizen of heaven, not a citizen of Beth Yeshua. You want to come here? Come here when you want. I don't take attendance. I'm not going to call you up and say, hey, I haven't seen you for a while. I'm not doing that. It's crazy. You're grown-ups, for the most part. I mean, <laughs> it's not by good works. It's not by church membership. It's not by doing one's best. It's by receiving him, by believing in his name. Not just, well, faith is not just, well, I, I believe you're the Messiah. It's a trusting obedience. You trust him so much that you obey what he says. That's what faith is, trusting obedience. So if Yeshua is our brazen altar, which obviously I'm here to tell you he is, and we lambano him, taken by the hand, then we become holy. Positionally holy, no? Now, there are historians that say that he wasn't crucified on the cross. I don't know, because he could have, actually, if you're crucified on a stake, which they were back in the days of Deuteronomy, check Deuteronomy 22, they were crucified on a stake, you would have one nail going through, this is much more painful than this. When you press up, it's much more painful, and death would happen faster. The neat thing is if he was like this, and we grab onto him, he's grabbing up to the Father, we're connected. You know, he's at the right hand of the Father, they're one. And if we grab onto him, then we're connected, and that's how the Holy Spirit flows. From God, through Yeshua, to our tabernacles. Amen. Moving on to the altar of incense. If you're taking notes, that's in Exodus 31 through 10. We have two verses. It says, you ought to make an altar on which to burn incense. Make it of acacia wood, again, incorruptible wood. Man is wood, but incorruptible, speaks of Messiah. It is to be 18 inches square, and three feet high, 18 is life, three feet is uh, divine perfection. Its horns are to be made of one piece with it. Let's take a look at a picture. Again, you see the horns. Any altar is going to have the horns because it speaks of sacrifice, it speaks of blood. The altar of incense was gold-plated wooden altar which stood in the holy place, right? It was in the holy place. Do, do, do you remember? It wasn't, it wasn't, it was in front of the tent of meeting. Correct? Yes? Tent of meeting, meaning not the tabernacle. Again, the holy place and the holy of holies. It says in Ephesians 5.2, 
Live a life of love. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be something? <laughs> wouldn't that be something if we could pull that off? <laughs> Live a life of love. Just as also the Messiah loved us. Love people like he loved you. I know some people kind of make it difficult, but you, you, could, you could change people. You could heap burning coals on them. Not that that's what you want to do. I'm going to love this guy so I can shove some coals on his head. And I hope they're hot. That has to do with what was going on in Judaism with shame when they actually wore a, a thing on their head with burning coals to shame. Not talking about that, but you can, love covers a multitude of sins. You could change people with love. That's what Neve Michael is all about. Basically, even though they have a lot of different people talking to them and a lot of different methodologies, the bottom line is those kids are nursed back to health by being ridiculously loved. And isn't that what we all kind of want, really? Even when we're adults, don't we come home? Sometimes I'm just like, and you know, I look at Bernadette and I just give her that look. We finish each other's sentences and she knows I had a hard day. So I look at it with that gleam in my eye like, baby girl, just give me a hug. And she looks back at me and goes, I've got to do the laundry. <laughs> Which, you know, she's saying, go to your room and work it out. <sighs> Live a life of love. Just as also the Messiah loved us. Indeed, and on our behalf gave himself up as an offering as a slaughtered, I, I love it. Because when we think of offering, it's like, here, I'd like to give you a little offering. A slaughtered, slaughtered, he was slaughtered. He was a slaughtered sacrifice to God with a pleasing fragrance. Look at this word in the Greek, obviously, we're looking at New Testament scriptures right now. A sweet smell, but metaphorically, a thing well-pleasing to God. Now, why was Yeshua's sacrifice so well-pleasing to God? Real simple. Look at what he said in John 19.30. This was his mission. He was born to die. Make no mistake. Everything else just got in the way. This was the whole mission, to die. After Yeshua had taken the wine, he said, it is finished. But he said it really loud. And letting his head droop, he delivered up his spirit. By the way, delivering up his spirit means nobody took his life. Not your sins, not my sins, not Pilate, not the Jews, not the Gentiles. No, 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 no. He, let, he gave it up willingly and lovingly and honorably. Look at the word finished. Telio, it means to bring to a close, to an end. In other words, what the collective blood of every sacrificial animal could never do Yeshua did. Namely, not only cover our sin, but remove our guilt. Now, guilt is something that we all deal with. Some of us are dealing with guilt right now from things that happened 30 years ago. A broken marriage, maybe you had a child out of wedlock and you didn't get to father him or mother him, and we deal with that guilt. We make believe we don't, and it doesn't come up all the time, but somehow it just shows up, right? like an uninvited guest. You could be like riding a bicycle and all of a sudden, or hear a song. Now, I know, are there any former Catholics here or any still practicing Catholics? Former. Okay. Should let that know. I'm not a Catholic anymore, okay? And if you put a statue up here, I'm out of here, you hear me? And I'm not calling you the Pope. You're not Pope Rabbi Greg. You're not infallible. Don't be sorry. I'm only playing with you. You're from Jersey? What part? Yeah. Yeah, I spent a lot of time down the Jersey Shore. Yeah, I caused a lot of damage down there in my... A lot. I don't even want to... We'll talk. Well, not when everybody's lit. Nah. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up in a very, you know, Catholic neighborhood. I know Catholicism really well. Bernadette was like... You know, straight up, hardcore Catholic. Um, went to Catholic grade school, middle school, and Catholic high school down the village, down the Greenwich Village. Anyway, um, Catholics tend to have a lot of guilt. 
It used to be a very guilt-ridden religion, but I got news for you, Mrs. Catholic. Uh-uh. The Jews have a corner on the guilt market. We are, you know, we just walk in it. But I think human beings do. I think the whole idea of this sacrifice being so overwhelming, so ridiculously overwhelming, you know, the whole story that God would take his word and put on flesh, you know what I mean? You know, to impregnate little Miriam and to be birthed like any other normal human being and to grow up with the idea to give his life so that we could spend eternity with God, Hallelujah. you know, in, in, an, in a magnificent kingdom, you know, without any sadness and sorrow, and that we'll get to see our loved ones again, that we really will be united with them. It's so crazy that it would, but, but what, what we're being provided, what the promise is so over the top, the sacrifice had to be over the top. And I think the sacrifice was so over the top that God did not want us to walk in guilt. Now, I know we still do, right? We still kind of takes time. Like we say we're sorry, and then we feel bad about it. I know, pff, ask my kids. I'm like the king of guilt. You know, if I do something wrong and I say I'm sorry still, it plays over and over. I'm trying to get past that, so that's why I spend so much time with Yeshua. Because if I feel like if God legitimately loved me this much, then he doesn't want me to operate in guilt. No more than if my child said to me, and then two days later they said, Dad, I still feel so bad. About what? About, about, remember, Dad, when I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Dad, two days ago, I, I'm sorry, I got to go, but I don't know what you're talking about. You follow? It says very clearly that God takes our sins as far as east is from west. That's a place nobody knows. It says very clearly in the prophetic books that he casts them in the bottom of the sea. Nobody's ever been down there. He says he throws them behind his back. I think he's trying to tell us something. We just can't totally believe it. But the problem isn't on the divine side. Yeshua takes care of that. The problem is on the human side. And I understand. It's a human thing, right? You know, it's, it's part of it. But God doesn't want us to walk in that. He really doesn't. And not only is Yeshua our altar of incense that way, but isn't he the mediator? And doesn't he intercede for us? How do you think your, your, your prayers get to heaven? Through him. He's there interceding. Because every time you see incense in the Bible, whether it's Luke 1, whether it's Revelation 5, I mean, it's Psalm 141, it's always relating to prayers. So isn't it wonderful that our prayers get transferred through our altar of incense, Yeshua? And they're heard, and they're answered back through him? Without him, there ain't no connection. Without him, there ain't no connection. Now, on a side note, your connection can be strong, your connection can be weak. If you've got some things going on that you shouldn't have done or some things that you should have done that you haven't. You know, we talk about overt sin, sins of commission, but we don't talk about secret sins. We don't talk about presumptuous sins. We don't talk about sins that we don't think are sins. What about the sins of omission? What about things we should have done that we didn't do? That's a sin. So sometimes we got a lot of that operating. The connection could be a little weak. But, you know, a little bit of repentance and remorse, it goes a long way. Things flow better. Next is the brazen laver. That's shown in Exodus 30. It's detailed 17 through 21. We have two verses. I don't know, he said to Moshe, you are to make a basin of bronze with a base of bronze for washing. Place it between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it. Do we have a picture? The old brazen laver. It was, it was big. It was huge. It wasn't a little, a little basin. And it was right before right right before the, the tent of meeting, right before. So after you've given your sacrifice, right, this is where the priests could wash their hands and feet. What do you think that symbolized, you know, washing hands and feet? You got to be, you know, you, it stands for purification. Before you approach, before you go into the holy place, you know, before you go into the holy place, you got you to be cleaned up, Right? It, it is significant to note that the brazen laver was the last thing to come in contact with before entering the tabernacle. So before entering God's presence, not the outer courtyard, before entering God's presence, one must be clean. I mean, if we, if we think about clean being totally holy, then nobody here, including myself, are totally holy. 
When the Bible says, when there's the, the great sermon, only one sermon in the whole Bible by Yeshua, and he says, be perfect as your father is perfect, what, what do most people hear? What do they hear about that word perfect? Most, most religious teachers, most theologians, and most pastors will tell you, have you ever heard this? It means mature, to mature. Have you ever heard that? Well, that's not true. That is one definition of that word, but not used in Matthew 5.48. Because if that was true, then what Yeshua would be saying is, be mature as your Father in heaven is mature. Do you think your Father in heaven needs to mature? It's perfect. 1 John 2, what does it say? My little children, I want you to sin as little as you can. So we all have to humble ourselves and grab onto Yeshua. I'm not saying to use Yeshua, you know this, and be flagrant. Titus takes care of that. It talks about no. Who, who in their right mind would take advantage of that love? You'd have to be nuts. Literally, mentally ill to see what Yeshua did for you, to understand it, to come in contact with that execution stake every day and get more of a revelation and then go, well, he paid for it all, so I'll do whatever I want. Nobody who's in love with the Lord would do that. Nobody who's truly born again would do that. But you must stay close to Yeshua because you will never reach perfection until you go where he comes. I'm not saying you shouldn't try, but people get upset. Usually it's non-Jewish people that watch and they go, why, why do you say that we can't be Torah observant? Because you can't. Not 100%. Nobody's been able to pull that off except Yeshua, and nobody will ever pull that off. So try, try. But you're going to be really frustrated if you think you can be perfect. Any perfectionists here? Any recovering perfectionists? Look, you're so perfect, couldn't even raise your hand. You know how hard that is, right? I was a perfectionist. I had to get 100. If I got a 99, I failed. It's a crazy way to live. But that's why I married Bernadette, because she was perfect. And I knew that the minute I met her. Yes, it does make up for that laundry comment. Dear, you're right. Look at what Titus 3, 5, by the way, Titus is one of the pastoral letters. You have 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. It's a very, very, very short letter, but it's amazing. It's amazing. And what Titus really says, the theme of Titus is that, yes, you've been saved by grace, but now do some good works. Like without good works, what salvation do you have? And it doesn't mean just help the poor. It means, you know, help the poor, help the widow, but also walk in a way that is worthy of calling yourself a follower of Yeshua. You know what I mean? Are you living a life that's worthy of his death? That's what Titus is asking. But in this third chapter, it says, he saved us. Hallelujah. He saved us. I think some people forget that as they march along in their little sanctification trail. They really feel like they're doing good. I'm, I'm a good believer. You're crazy. You've come too far away from the cross. He saved us, not because of the righteous things we have done. Come on, it's all over the Bible, man. What are you reading? But because of his mercy, his chesed, his tender, loving kindness, he washed away. That's how we come into the presence. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth, born again. It's amazing to be born again. It's amazing. And new life through the Holy Spirit. Man, look at that verse. Man, oh man, oh man. He saved us from the guilt and the penalty of our sins. It is not by good works. The constant theme of the new covenant is that good people don't go to heaven. Do you know if you break down every single religion to its base tenet? Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Jehovah Witness, Mormon, you know if you break down every single religion to its base tenets, you know what you get? Works. You have to work your way to heaven. Only our faith. You break it down to its base tenets, you get the execution stake. Yes, I do good works. 
But I don't do it for my salvation. I do it because of my salvation. How could I be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, see somebody in need, see a kid without shoes, not want to get him shoes? Who could do that? It's insanity. Good people don't go to heaven. It's sinners saved by grace. The new birth is a miracle. It's a miracle. Nobody can explain it. I don't understand it. I don't understand how one day I was doing and the next day I was doing. That's how radical it was. You know, one day I'm getting high listening to all the wrong music. The next day I'm not getting high and throw out the music. The Spirit of God brings about an incredible trans... It's a transformation. It doesn't put new clothes on the old man. It puts a new man in the clothes. And if you quote me, quote me. You know, some people say, well, ah, and it sounds weird. When I quote somebody... I quote them. If you're going to quote somebody, quote them. Because somebody's going to figure it out and go, it wasn't you. If you quote somebody, quote them. Now this covers all seven furnishings in the tabernacle. But what about, even though it's not a furnishing, what about the curtain? There's something to that curtain that I think a lot of people miss. Let's take a look. 2631. It says, you are to make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely woven. I added white in there. So if you're, if you're looking at your Bible, go, wait a minute. Right? Because linen is always white. If you look it up, it's bleach. It says bleached garment, white. I just didn't want you to get lost in it, okay? Make it with keravim, worked in, that have been crafted by a skilled artisan. Now let's take a look at a picture. So this is the Holy of Holies with the Ark. This is the holy place here, and I'll show you another picture in a little bit. And this is the curtain, okay, in the tabernacle. The curtain was much bigger in Herod's temple. He made everything. He supersized everything. Um, I think he had good intentions. I really do. I don't think he had an edifice complex. But the tabernacle was divided into two rooms. The holy place, measuring 30 feet by 15 30 by 15, and then behind it was the Holy of Holies, and that measured 15 by 15. Those two rooms were separated by a veil. Let's look at this word, curtain. It's porachet in the Hebrew, and it's veil. Now, I'll tell you why that's important in a sec. Look at Exodus 26.1. You ought to make the tabernacle with 10 curtains, because this wasn't the only curtain. Okay, this was just the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. But there was curtains all over the tabernacle of finely woven linen and with blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. Take a look at that word, curtains. It's curtains or drapes. Yeriah. So God is making a distinction. Rabbi, who, who bothers doing this? Um, why wouldn't you do it? How do you study the script? I mean, how do you study the scriptures? You just can't a memory memory verse? That's ridiculous. I want to know what's going on. God, why are you making a distinction between curtains and a curtain? What, what's the big deal? Look at the uh, another pick for a minute. So here you have, see, remember I told you that's the whole tabernacle, right? There's the brazen altar, there's the brazen laver. Before you go in, then you go in, there's the menorah, table of showbread, there's the altar of incense got to send up your prayers before you get through here but this is the gauntlet right only one man from one tribe one time he could go in there and drop seven droplets of blood on that altar to have israel's sins forgiven and if you think about there's so many connections even though yeshua died on passover when you think of yom kippur weren't there two goats and one was to forget, you know, to forgive sin, and one was to take the guilt away. And didn't blood and water come out of his side? Didn't they let Barabbas go? Don't you let one goat go? And didn't Yeshua was the goat that got slain? And Barabbas, Bar Abba, means son of a father. Yeshua is son of the father. And through this son of the father, you become son of the father. 
I don't want to, I can go on and on. I'm not trying to be in, like, but it connects, guys. Your Bible isn't just made to just memorize a few verses. It all connects. You got to connect the dots, because once you connect the dots, it becomes high def. Better than 4K. Best picture you can get. And your shoe becomes clear, and he pops off the pages, every single page. Why do I worship him? Because it's on every page. That's the whole Bible's about him. <laughs> what do you do without him? Got no connection. Got no Holy Spirit flow. What are you going to do? So, God instructed the children of Israel to make curtains in the tabernacle. He uses the word Yeriah. The Porachef is a different story. Let me show you. Let's take a look at, um, first, before you put up that verse, Matthew 2. Hang on. Purple. What do we know about purple? What does purple represent? Royalty, always. First Kings 8, 27. You look it up. It talks about the purple robes of the kings in Solomon's day. Purple always represents royalty and kingship. And what are we depicted by? Which creature? We have four living creatures. Who's the king of the jungle? The lion. Yeah, the lion, right? The Gospel of Matthew, each Gospel is written to a different audience. I'm sure most people don't know that. How important is it? I think it's important. Otherwise, what do we need four Gospels for? <laughs> Matthew was the Gospel to the Jews. It was the Gospel to reach the Jews. Matthew contains more Old Testament references than all the other Gospels put together. It also contains a complete Jewish genealogy, right? Right? It shows Yeshua's lineage as the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Israel and the Jewish people were looking for a king, weren't they? They were looking for a king. They didn't have a king for a long time. There's no king in Judah, no king in Israel. They were looking for a king. They were looking for a king. Well, look at Matthew 2, 1 through 2. We're almost home. After Yeshua was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread, in the land of Yehuda, the praises of God, during the time when Herod was king, Magi, not astronomers, not Dion Warwick's friends, okay? These guys were trained. Their parents and grandparents were trained by Daniel. They knew the prophecies. They knew about this chocheb, this messianic star that was coming, and they were looking for it generationally. They came from the east, Babylon, where Daniel was, to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, and asked, where is this newborn king of the Jews? All I could say is I know sometimes we have Jewish people watching, to my Jewish brothers, or my homies, or should I say, my homies, <laughs> Yeshua is your king. Look no further, you're not going to find another one. There were 39 kings in Judah and in Israel. He is number 40, and 40 resents overcoming and victory and deliverance. You will only be delivered through Yeshua's blood. There you have it. Next is scarlet. And what do we know about scarlet? What does scarlet always represent? Blood and sacrifice. Although your sins be like? Yes. And this is depicted by what animal? The ox. The, it could be depicted by a lamb, but the lamb wasn't one of the animals, wasn't one of the four living creatures, right? You had four living creatures. You had a lion, you had an ox, you had a man, and you had an eagle. So that's why we have four. Look, there's four gospels, there's four directions. You know, there's four living creatures, right? Shabbat was the fourth commandment because it four talks about creation. And there were four tops. They sung Bernadette. <laughs> That's not important. That's not important. Mark was the gospel to the Romans. Yes. Why? The gospel, you know, the Romans were tough, man. They were soldiers, warriors. They were tough. Romans were tough, man. The Roman games, you know, after the Greek games, these guys were tough. I mean, when they boxed and they fought and they wrestled, they did it to the death. Not to submission, to the death. Why do you think Paul, you think Paul was a big tough guy? Paul was a little Jewish guy that studied the Bible. You know, a little Jewish guy that studied the Torah all the time. He was picked, handpicked in the diaspora. We need one really smart Jewish kid to come to Jerusalem and study under Gamaliel who studied under Hillel, the greatest rabbi in Judaism. So he got handpicked. But what do we know about him? He was a Roman citizen from Tarsus. And they had Roman games, right? 
So he watched these guys. He didn't participate, but he watched them box. And he watched them wrestle. Why do you think he said, if we have believers could be as intense as they are for this little stupid sport, this little wreath that they get, we change the whole world. We change the whole world. Why do you think he said, we don't box at the air? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood? We run the race? Why do you think he's using this term- terminology? He saw these athletes. So these athletes fight and fight for a dopey trophy. How much more should we fight for the kingdom of heaven? The gospel of Mark is heavy on action. Heavy on action. Just like the Romans. Light on thought. Heavy on deeds. Light on words. Long on miracles. 19. Short on parables. 4. Rome was looking for a sacrificial servant. Take a look at Mark 10, 45. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Well, look no further, my Gentile brothers. Yeshua is the sacrificial servant. White. White represents what? Purity and perfection. It's depicted by the man. Luke was written to the Greeks. It was the gospel to the Greeks. The Greeks love philosophy. Socrates and Aristotle and... Plato, yes, they loved philosophy. They wanted to figure things out. They were thinkers. Why are things happening the way they are? Where did we come from? Where are we going? What's our purpose in life? This gospel focuses on what? Yeshua's prayer life. It focuses on Yeshua's compassion. Luke focused on Yeshua's empathy and his humanity. What did they call him? What did he call himself in Luke? Son of Man, a title, a title given to represent the Messiah and represent 26 times this messianic title was used. The Greeks were looking for the perfect man. They were trying to become perfect. Look at Luke 23, 47. When the Roman officer saw what had happened, he began to praise God and said, surely this man was innocent. This was no regular man is what he was saying. So look no further, my philosophical brothers. Although Socrates and Plato and Aristotle were deep thinkers, they were far far from perfect. Yeshua is the perfect man. Last but not least is the color blue. Blue. Blue represents what? Yeah, the sapphire dome. We call the heavens. It's depicted by what? Ox don't fly in the sky. Man doesn't fly. Lions, they could jump, but not for the eagle. This is the universal gospel. This is for all people. And it's depicted by the eagle because the eagle is an ultimate overcomer. It never turns its back on a storm like a chicken will. And it always flies into the storm to lift itself up. It uses the storm to get better. John is distinct from the synoptic gospels. That means seen through the same eyes like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In that the gospel of John begins not with Yeshua's birth. You don't read about his birth. You don't read about his earthly ministry, do you? No, but with the activity and the characteristics of the Son of God before he became a man. The Gospel of John speaks of the deity of Yeshua as the only begotten Son of God. Look at John 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things came to be through him, And without him, nothing made had being. In verse 1, we see two persons of the Godhead. God the Father and God the Son. Verse 2 declares that he had no beginning. Therefore, he did not become a person for the first time in Bethlehem. Verse 3 says that he was not a created being. Rather, he was the creator of all things. And all things were created through him. So look no further, everyone. Yeshua is the sovereign, sacrificial, sinless Son of God. Hallelujah. The Gnostics that we read about in Revelation, they taught that there were various ranks and classes of spirit beings between God and matter. And that Yeshua, they believed in Jesus. He belonged to one of those classes. Jehovah Witnesses, beautiful people. I have Jehovah Witness friends, but they teach that before our Lord came into the world, he was a created angel, none other than the archangel Michael. In our day, we have spiritists that claim that Yeshua is an advanced spirit of the sixth sphere. 
Here's the bottom line, guys. Yeshua is either a lunatic, a liar, or he's Lord. Those are your choices. And if he is Lord, then he's Lord of all, or he's not Lord at all. There are many roads in life, but only one road leads to the Father. Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. And his death opened up a new and a life-giving way right through the veil into the very Holy of Holies. So for those of us who are born again, let us not forget to come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. Amen and Shabbat Shalom. Why'd you put the tide over your hand? You didn't, you know. What? You told him to do that? He's not a leper. What are you doing? That's horrible. No, it's not. He's my friend. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha Adonai, vayishmarecha. Yo Adonai ponov elecha, vehunecha. Yisa Adonai ponov elecha, v'yasem lecha. Shalom. I love you guys. Shabbat shalom.